everyone. So this is the last video that I have in my series on protein structure and function in foods. And today we're going to talk about how protein structure relates to our ability to measure it. And the fact that there's there are clear methods on measurement. I know the folks who are at Niagara College have a course with uh, Dr. Sunan Wang about uh, food analysis. And that's where you'll talk about measuring protein. But I want to talk about how the structure of protein impacts on your ability to measure it. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to describe how the structure of protein influences its measurement in food products and define how different protein measurement methods can be influenced by protein solubility, amino acid composition, and differing nitrogen sources within the food products themselves. So I'm not going to teach you how to do the methods. I'm going to talk about structure and function of protein in relation to its measurement capability. So one of the old methods of measuring protein is called the Keldahl method. And it's often also called nitrogen determination. As you can guess, we're not actually measuring the protein. We are measuring the nitrogen within the food. And we have to think that protein is the dominant source of nitrogen in most food products. And that is true, except that there are other sources of nitrogen in food. And we have to be considerate about that. What's going on in Keldahl? Well, we're digesting the product using concentrated hydrosol or, or sulfuric acid, pardon me, and we're using a catalyst, usually a nickel catalyst, and then we're converting all those amino acids and the, the free nitrogen into ammonium ion. Amino acids, it's derived from ammonium. We're then neutralizing it so that we're getting ammonia. We're, so we're neutralizing with sodium or potassium hydroxide, and then we're titrating to measure the quantity of ammonia in the sample. And we're doing that by colorimetric titration. So we are also capable of measuring the nitrogen within a product by combustion or Dumas method. And that's where we're taking a small weighed out, accurately weighed out uh, portion of sample, and we're dropping it into an oxidation chamber and we're burning it. And then we're going to reduce it and trap carbon dioxide and water vapor. We run it through a column and you can measure the quantity of nitrogen gas that's coming off of that. And so we can correlate the quantity of sample applied to the quantity of nitrogen gas that um, evolved off of that sample and we can correlate the two. Big challenge is not all nitrogen comes from protein in foods. Purines, pyrimidines, DNA, RNA, urea, um, nitrite, nitrate. Um, these can all be contributing non-protein nitrogen. And in the uh, calculation of Keldahl or Dumas protein, we have to add an N conversion factor. And the, the, the general N conversion factor is 6.25 to be able to get that protein. But that's not true of all different food products. 6.25 works fine on corn, eggs, peas, meat, beans, but we have different conversion factors in the case of nuts because they have high levels of um, purines and pyrimidines, you have to use a completely different conversion factor, 5.3. And so it's important to be aware that in the case of Caldaro Jumas, where we're measuring just nitrogen, there's lots of other nitrogen sources that are out there. Yes, protein, by merit of being an amino acid, contains lots of nitrogen, but in many cases, the other sources of nitrogen within the foods can be very confounding. What I note on this list is there's no, no leafy green vegetables. Leafy green vegetables have lots of natural nitrate, and that could be really, really confounding. The thing is, we're not overly worried about the protein quantity in there because that's not relating out to the functionality of the ingredient. I'm just gonna, oh, actually, <laughs> there's a reason I have this slide in here. The next method that we're using is going to be dye binding. And dye binding, the most common dye binding 
assay that's out there is called the Bradford assay. And this is where we are using a dye called Kumasi Blue. Kumasi Blue likes to bind to arginine and to a lesser extent, tyrosine, tryptophan, histidine, phenylalanine, phenylalanine. And let's just look, arginine down here. So it's binding to just those five amino acids within the protein. And what occurs is that Kumasi blue goes from being a brown dye to being a blue dye when in interaction with these amino acids. So here's the thing. In our amino acid sequence, we may have more arginine or less arginine in that net protein. And depending on the situation, you could have a really arginine rich protein and the dye binding, uh, it, depending on what you make your standard curve with, you could be misreading the amount of protein that's within that, within that sample. So as I mentioned before, when the dye is bound to arginine or to a lesser extent tyrosine, tryptophan, histidine, or phenylalanine, it's going to create a blue, a blue absorbance at 595 nanometers. And the free dye is going to be um, having an absorbance at 470 nanometers. But what also interacts with this, the temperature, you can have other non-proteins that interact with the Kumasi dye. Depending on your buffering system, you can also be impacting it. Most importantly though, protein quality and solubility. If the protein is not soluble and not interacting in the solution, it's not going to interact with the dye. Or if it's going to interact with the dye, but flocculate that dye out, that's also problematic. And so you need to be very aware that your protein needs to be soluble to be using Kumasi or the Bradford assay as your means of measuring the protein. And just to, just to walk through here, that protein has to be soluble for us to be able to measure the absorbance. And so think about that from a capability of measuring protein when we are measuring protein in food products, it's not as simple as just let's go and do a Kumasi Bradford assay. You may be needing to apply one of the more advanced methods. However, those advanced methods have their own limitations in terms of measuring the total amount of protein that's out there. Be aware. Don't be worried. These are methods that are standard and are used widely by the industry. So don't go out there and say, well, I can't use this method because because there's all these other interactions. Just be aware of it and be cognizant so that when you're out there, you can understand the biases within methodology. All right, I'm hearing a lot of banging outside, so I'm going to call this video uh, finished. That's a lot of protein videos, and I hope you have some good questions to ask. I love hearing from you, and I love it when you are curious about your learning. So take care, have fun, ask lots of good questions.